Children, you are dismissed to go down to your classrooms downstairs. For those of you staying up here, please turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And as you're turning there, I am going to just uh, give you a few announcements, a few things that are going on in the life of the church. Uh, Next week, we will be having a few baptisms. We are excited and encouraged by the Lord's work in the hearts of and minds of people, and we will be celebrating together as a church next week uh, a few baptisms. Uh, We have prayer meeting this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. here at the church. We invite all of you, if you are able, to come and be a part of uh, a prayer meeting together, to gather together and to lift up one another to the throne of God above And then lastly, just one thing for the young adults. We had a meeting last week. We're trying to get a head start on our next meeting in April. We're going to be going bowling. And in order to uh, know how many lanes we need to reserve, we need to know how many of you are coming. So please make sure to just sign your name at the back. Um, No other commitment beyond. We just want to know how many people are are planning on being there. So please do that by my wife's gone. I think she said March 26th uh, so that we can make the, uh, the arrangements that week. All right, Mark chapter 7. We are going to read from Mark chapter 7, verse 1, down to the end of verse 23. This again is what Holy Scripture says to us today. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other observations, or sorry, many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Who do your, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he, that is Jesus, said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And... Whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me. All of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Let's just bow one more time and ask the Lord to help us understand his word this morning. God in heaven, we do come before you, recognizing our need of you, our need of your help by the power of your spirit to understand the significance of your word. We ask that you would move in us, Move our hearts to see and understand so that we might be obedient to your word. 
I pray for the children downstairs and ask that you would open up their hearts as well. Give their teachers clarity of speech. Give their teachers the right words to say so that the gospel could be very clear to those young hearts downstairs. And for the rest of us, Lord, we need your help as well. And so we come before you humbly asking for your grace. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I read an article from a few months ago of a man in Burnaby, British Columbia. I don't know if you know where that is. I have no idea where it is, but I read an article about a guy from Burnaby. And he bought this watch, this Rolex watch, secondhand for $10,000. That sounds like a lot of money, and it is. For those of you that don't know, Rolex is one of the most prestigious premium watchmake, watchmaker uh, brands. A very luxury style, very high-end and uh, rich-looking watch. And after this man bought, uh, bought this watch from somebody he found, I, wasn't, I couldn't figure out if it was Kijiji or something like that. After he bought this watch, he became suspicious, and he took the watch to get appraised. And once he had it appraised, all of his fears came to life, and it turned out that the watch was indeed a fake. The watch was a knockoff. Uh, the receipt that the seller had and the certificate of authenticity, they were also fake. They weren't real. The man had paid $10,000 for a watch that was, in reality, barely worth $100. We, we live in a world of knockoffs. We live in a world built on knockoff products. There are companies that make money uh, building knockoff clothing, knockoff handbags. We have knockoff computer gadgets and knockoff car parts. We even have knockoff candy, chips, and cereal. We have knockoff categories of, of almost everything. We live in a world of knockoffs and imitations. And that includes many forms of knockoff religion, knockoff faith. Our world is filled with religions that pretend to be the real thing, pretend to be authentic. They pretend that their system can bring some sort of joy or satisfaction or happiness, but they just can't. Knockoff religions may look like they're concerned with holiness and piety, with religious things. They may appear to offer a way to heaven, but when we have them appraised, like the man did with his watch, when we have them appraised, we find these knockoff religions to be cheap alternatives to the real thing. These knockoff religions can't do what the real thing can do. They underperform. They can't get the job done. And we need to make sure that we understand the difference between that which truly saves, true religion, true holiness, the true way to heaven, we need to understand the distinction between what is true and all of the other fake knockoffs, those that which pretend to save. Our passage this morning shows us three marks, three signs of knockoff religions. It zooms in on the Pharisees and their specific knockoff religion, but it gives us the principles of every knockoff religion. These marks serve as a warning. They call us to assess where we have placed our hope. Is our hope in God or is our hope in a cheap knockoff? The first mark that we see in our text is that the knockoff is prioritized. It's elevated to a position of importance that it shouldn't have. It's given the praise and honor of the real thing when in reality it's only an imitation. The knockoff is given priority. The knockoff is prioritized. And we see this in verses 1 through 8. In verse 2, the Pharisees observe the disciples eating with unwashed hands, that is, defiled hands. They are irritated, they're put off, they're angry, frustrated. They're annoyed that the disciples don't observe the tradition of the elders, they say. We see this phrase, tradition of the elders, or commandments of men, mentioned seven times in this passage. The issue that the Pharisees have is not with the law of God, is not with what God has said. The issue that they have 
is their own man-made rules and Jesus and his disciples' lack of desire to follow what they have said. It's important to notice and to see that they're not concerned with the disciples' physical state. That is, they're not worried about the disciples having physically dirty hands. They weren't scolding the disciples like we sometimes scold our kids when they forget to wash their hands before they come to the dinner table. Parents, have you ever done that? Kids, go wash your hands. That's not what the Pharisees are doing here. They're upset because, as it says in verse three, the disciples didn't wash their hands properly. The NIV will use the word ceremonial. I think the King James Version says oft, a lot, the right way. The Greek phrase underneath this, these English words mean literally with a fist. It sounds like an odd thing to say. They didn't wash their hands with a fist. There's some debate about what exactly does this mean, with a fist? Does it mean with a cupped hand? Does it mean that you know, they kind of dip their hand in? What does that mean? We're not quite sure exactly what kind of washing this with a fist looked like. But what we do know is that with a fist has nothing to do with the actual dirt on the hands. It has everything to do with a ceremonial ritual washing. It's all about ritualism. It's not about actual cleanness of the hands, that is filthiness and dirt. It's about ritual cleansing. And there were many other op- objects that they submitted to this type of ritual washing that we see in verse four. It was the pots the vessels, dining couches. The question is, where did these rituals come from? Where did they come up with, where where did this idea come from that you should wash your hands in a certain way and you should wash these vessels in a certain way? Where, why do they observe these, these kind of laws? As we look at the Bible, particularly the Old Testament scriptures, the law of Moses, what we see as we start working through all of those laws that God gave, we see that there are no laws like the ones that these Pharisees hold to. These traditions were created by men. They weren't laws given by God. Yes, God has lots to say about washing. He has lots of washing laws in the Mosaic law, but there are no washings just like this. The priests were to wash their hands and their feet before they entered the tabernacle. A ceremonial washing, ceremonial cleansing that yes, we have been cleansed and are able to come in and serve in the presence of God. What the Pharisees have done over time, they've taken this law that God gave specifically to the priests and they've attributed it to themselves. They've taken it upon themselves even though the Lord did not put it on them. And they take God's law specifically for the priests, and they take it to ridiculous, even absurd extremes where anybody who looked at it would go, where did you get this from? What's worse is that the Pharisees not only take laws and things upon themselves that God didn't prescribe, they actually take those laws, those traditions, and they impose them on other people. That's exactly what they're doing in verse five. They're imputing defilement to the disciples when God didn't impute defilement to the disciples. God didn't say they were defiled. God didn't say that they were unclean because of their hands. The Pharisees were. They say that the disciples' hands are defiled, that is unclean, common, ordinary, because they did not subscribe to the Pharisees' man-made traditions. The Pharisees saw their way of doing things as the holy way, the only holy way not God's way. But Jesus, in verse six, he's, he's having none of it. He's not, he's not swallowing that pill that they're trying to give to him. He responds by saying that their way, their man-made ritualistic washings aren't actually a mark of holiness. They're not a mark of being close to God at all. It's actually a mark of distance from God. And he said to them, verse six, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He calls them hypocrites, disingenuous, insincere. The word is used to describe actors on a stage. It comes from the the realm of theater in the Greek language. It, It means literally somebody who wears a mask. Actors on a stage would wear a mask. They would pretend to be somebody else as part of the play. The Pharisees put on a show. They put on a mask and put on a show of holiness, but they're not actually clean. 
It's not actually true of them on the inside. They're not sanctified or holy because their hearts are far from God. They only give him lip service. They talk a lot and say a lot. They speak from their mouths, but it's not true in their hearts. Their hearts are distanced from God, which means, as it says in verse 7, their worship is in vain. It's futile, idle, fruitless. It will bring no success in the end. You go down that path and there is no fruitfulness for your labors. Their acts of worship, that is these ritualistic washings of both hands and pots and cups and all sorts of other things, have no effect on actually bringing them closer to God. Why? Because these washings are not what God has prescribed. It's not the law that God had given. They were man-made forms of worship. They were things that they had started with, with the good, God's law, and they had taken it and twisted it and applied it in areas that the Lord had no intention of applying them to. Jesus isn't saying that washing is bad. Jesus isn't saying that cleansing isn't necessary. God's law was clear that, that these things are important. Cleansing and washing and being pure before the Lord. Those are very important. Jesus isn't condemning God's law and what God's law has to say about purity. He's condemning their shift, that is the Pharisees' shift, away from God's word by taking God's word and applying it where God had not applied it by taking their traditions and prioritizing them over God's law. We just sang earlier, we will trust God's word alone, where his perfect will is known. Our traditions shift like sand, while his truth forever stands. We must cling to the real thing. We must cling to God's word. Our hearts begin to drift the moment we begin to look for anything outside of God's word for our hearts. The Pharisees doubted the sufficiency of God's word. They thought God's law wasn't good enough. It wasn't able to actually get them clean in the way that God had prescribed, so they elevated their own laws. They prioritized their own traditions. They brought up these things that they had, and they said, no, in order to be holy, you must actually do what what we say. They prioritized their traditions above God's word. But it gets worse. Prioritizing man-made, knock-off religions above God's word eventually leads to a full-on rejection of God's word. This is the second mark that we see in our passage in verses 9 through 13. The word of God is rejected. It began with prioritizing traditions, prioritizing the knockoff, prioritizing what began with God's law but had shifted, had changed, had been twisted. It began with prioritizing the things that we come up with, our ideas, and it leads to an ultimate rejection of what God has actually said. It's cast aside. God's word is cast aside for the sake of these traditions, for the sake of the knockoff. The original is abandoned because they prefer the cheap imitation. God's word is rejected. It's not always easy to understand sarcasm, is it? Have you ever heard somebody speak and you misunderstood, you thought they were being sarcastic but they really weren't, or maybe somebody was being sarcastic and you didn't get it at all, so you you answer the question and they're going, I was being sarcastic. It can be hard to understand sarcasm sometimes, especially when we're reading it. It's really hard to read sarcasm. You need to hear it in a voice to really understand it. But it seems pretty obvious as we look in verse nine, Jesus is kind of heaping up the sarcasm here. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. You have a fine way of abandoning God's law for the sake of your own ideas. You claim to love God's law, but you don't love it at all. You reject it so that you can establish Observe, participate, so that you can establish the traditions that you prefer over God's law. For example, have you ever had somebody uh, accuse you of something, but they don't have a specific example of you actually doing that something? Or maybe you've done that, you've accused somebody of doing something, and then they say, oh yeah, when did I do that? And you're like, "Uh, I'm not quite sure. I've heard this can happen between spouses. 
It's never happened between me and my wife. And I'm sure nobody here has ever done that. But I've heard it can happen between spouses. You always do that. Why do you always do that? And then the other will say, I don't do that. When do I do that? And I'm left, I mean, not me. The hypothetical husband is left sputtering, going, "Uh, I don't know. But I know you always do it. I don't have an example, but I know you always do it. Jesus is here anticipating that question of, oh yeah, when did we do that? Jesus has just accused them, the Pharisees, the elite of the elite, the the spiritually high people in Jewish society. He's just accused them of transgressing, of abandoning God's law, of getting rid of it, of tossing it aside for the sake of their own traditions. And he's anticipating this question of, oh yeah, Jesus, that doesn't sound very cool. That doesn't sound very right. When did we do that? So he gives them an example. It's like, he, it's like he can see into their hearts and into their minds and knows exactly what their objections are going to be. Here's what God's law says. Honor your father and mother. Here's what God's law says. The punishment should be if that command is transgressed. If that command is broken, here's what should happen. That person should be put to death. That term reviling. If somebody reviles their parents, it's taken from the word cursing. If they would impose a curse on their parents, they should be put to death. This is not talking about a five-year-old child who gets angry and has a temper tantrum with their parents. This is talking about grown adult children who, when their parents age and become needy, are dependent upon their children to survive, the child will curse them and abandon them to death. God's law said if any child, any son of Israel, abandons his parents to death, they should be put to death. The very thing that they would curse their parents with should happen to them. And then in verse 11, those are the laws there in verses uh, verses 9 and 10. But then in verse 11, Jesus describes this tradition that the Pharisees had called Corban. And how Corban had replaced God's law concerning one's relationship with mother and father. The word Corban comes from the Hebrew word for offering. It was a special kind of oath where something, money, land, possessions, whatever you had was promised, was dedicated to God. It was an offering. It was Corban given to God. And that sounds good, right? Dedicating an offering to the Lord. How could Jesus possibly have a problem with even a tradition that is dedicating things to God? Well, Jesus presents a well-known scenario where a son tells his parents that he won't take care of them in their old age. Something that he was required to do under God's law. And he gets out of fulfilling God's law Because whatever he would have used to provide for his parents is now Corban. That is, given, promised, dedicated to God. Whatever was going to be going to you, mom and dad, sorry. You get nothing because it's all given to God. Sorry about that. He can't use it for his parents anymore because he's promised it to the Lord. What has this man done? He has not uttered any words in terms of cursing them bringing curses from the Lord down upon them. He has not uttered any curse words towards them, and yet he has essentially cursed his parents. He's broken God's law by disguising their condemnation to abandonment and death under an act of holiness. They've hidden it under this idea of generosity towards the Lord. Some, no doubt, reviled They cursed their parents out of spite and hatred. And the Lord said there is a way to deal with hard-hearted individuals, hard-hearted sons who refuse to take care of their parents. They must be put to death. But the Pharisees rejected God's law. They put that off to the side in favor of their own tradition. They've said that their word has a higher priority than God's word. They nullify God's law. They cancel it out. They, They... They negate it. They say it doesn't really matter. They hold people uh, accountable to their own tradition rather than to God's law. This individual in this hypothetical scenario that popped up all too often in Israel's history, this individual should not have been allowed to live. 
But the Pharisees say, you know what? It's all right. We're not going to obey God's law in this scenario because you made a promise according to our tradition. Some people say things in the heat of the moment, things they don't really mean, right? I'm sure none of you have ever said anything that you didn't really mean, right? You think of when a, when a teenager going through those heyday years of puberty yells at their parents, I hate you. Do they really hate mom and dad? Maybe. <laughs> but in many cases, it's not an expression of what's truly in their heart. It's not really their attitude towards their parents. They don't really mean it. They're just upset in the moment. They're frustrated. They're angry, whatever it may be. There were some who made rash oaths. They were quick to speak. They let the words fly out of their mouths without really thinking about it. They made vows and promises that they didn't really, really mean to make. In the heat of the moment, they say something that they didn't really mean to, like, like, I'm going to dedicate all that I have to God just so I can get back at my parents. I'm so mad. I'm so frustrated with them right now. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to condemn them to death under God's law. I'm going I'm to abandon them, and I'm going to say, you know what? I'm giving it all to God, and I'm going to get out of it. Some did it because they truly hated their parents. Some people just say stupid things when they're angry and frustrated. God had articulated a way for people to deal with rash vows. As we look at God's law, there were ways for people who spoke too quickly to be excused from the things that they said in the heat of the moment. But in verse 12, we see the Pharisees didn't allow these people out of their vows, even if they wanted to. Then you no longer permit him now it's not just, oh, he, he said something stupid or he said something silly in the heat of the moment. The Pharisees bind them, not according to God's law, they bind their conscience and bind their bodies to their own tradition. And the Pharisees now force these people to break God's law twice. First in breaking God's law by condemning their parents to death and then secondly, breaking God's law by not being able to fulfill and abide by the God-ordained ways to be forgiven of rash oaths. And this is just one example. One particular case where God's law was rejected in favor of man-made traditions. In verse 13, and many such things you do. This is just one example. I could go on and on and on, Jesus is thinking. The Pharisees have accused Jesus of minimizing the law, but it is actually they who have taken God's law and minimized it. They've rejected God's law and elevated their own laws above everything else. They've prioritized their own ideas. Yes, perhaps it began with God's law, but now it, it doesn't look anything like God's law anymore. It has been transformed and deformed into some ugly head of tradition that now actually causes people to break God's law. And we must take great care as the church of Jesus Christ. We must be cautious. We must pay attention to our doctrine and our lives because we are not immune from this temptation to prioritize our tradition above God's word. Are we? I don't think so. Church history tells us that we, we do this more frequently than we probably would want to admit. The church has often made traditions more important than God's word. Traditions like, just to name a few, things like wearing suits or things like what instruments we use when we worship, even things like the translation of the Bible that we use, that we read and preach and teach from. Things that flow out of, that originally started with a, de, a good desire, that started with God's word, but became changed and transformed. Just to take the example of wearing suits, where did that start from? It started from a desire to, to show reverence and respect before the Lord as we worship. It started from a place of having a good heart, of not being lazy, of not being irreverent as we come to gather and worship. But what happened? Over time, in the minds of some people, it became the only expression of holiness and reverence. It became the only way that you could properly worship God. 
I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wearing suits. I'm not saying that if in your heart your conscience desires to wear a suit as an expression of reverence towards God, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you bind your conscience to that where God's word has not bound your conscience, you have taken a tradition, a tradition that actually can't be transplanted to many other areas in the world because they just don't have suits and ties like we do. We must be careful that we do not prioritize our traditions, make our traditions passed down from generation after generation. We cannot make our traditions equal to, and not just equal to, but above God's law. May God help us as, as individuals and as a congregation to see where we are in danger of, of elevating our traditions above God's word. And, and may he give us grace to repent when our error is shown to us. Uh, look now at the final mark of, of man-made religion, of knockoff religion. We see this in verses 14 through 23. The knockoff is insufficient. It cannot do what you need it to do. We are defiled. We are unclean before God. And the knockoff cannot cleanse. It cannot purify. The knockoff is unable to address the real issue. The knockoff is insufficient. As Jesus so often does when he's teaching, he tells a parable. We know it's a parable in verse 15 because it, it's called a parable down in verse 17. It's not the kind of parable we're typically used to, right? What kind of parables are we, are we used to in church? Parables that are stories. There's the parable of the shepherd going after the lost sheep. There's the parable of uh, the soils that we saw earlier in the Gospel of Mark. There's parables that are usually stories of some kind that we then understand has a spiritual or heavenly application. But the word parable is actually, it just means something that comes alongside, something that is brought alongside something else. So the parables, the stories, come alongside Jesus' teaching to help us understand his actual teaching. And here, this parable in verse 15 is something that comes alongside Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees. He says, hear me, all of you, and understand. Listen up. Pay attention. Look at me. I want you to pay attention to what I'm going to say right now. You need to hear what I'm going to say. There is nothing he says in verse 15, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. As parables so often are, this is initially offered without comment. Jesus simply speaks the parable and he moves on. But the meaning here isn't all that difficult to understand, even though we haven't quite gotten to the explanation that Jesus will give to the disciples. What does this parable mean? Well, it seems fairly obvious that Jesus is saying that defilement, uncleanness, impurity before God isn't an external matter. It's not something that's on the outside of us. It's not something that you deal with on the outside. Defilement is internal. It must be dealt with on the inside. The disciples don't fully understand what Jesus means. They haven't fully seen how this parable is connected to what Jesus has been talking about with the Pharisees, this big issue of defilement. So they ask Jesus to explain a little bit more, which is exactly what Jesus does. Jesus explains that spiritual purity isn't a matter of, of what or how you eat. Your standing before God isn't determined by the state of your hands. The kind of food that you eat doesn't matter. And thus he declared all foods clean, the text says. This would have been a very important thing for Mark's readers, Roman Gentile readers. Should we submit ourselves to the Jewish food laws? Must we become just like Jews in order to be truly holy? Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians. Peter talks about this in his interaction with Cornelius. Paul will bring up another example where people were trying to force external laws onto Gentile believers. In Galatians, he's talking about circumcision. Paul says, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with the external state of your body. 
but the internal state of your heart. The Pharisees were, were right to be concerned about purity. That's a good thing, right? For all of the wrong that the Pharisees get, for all of the, the negative things that are said about the Pharisees, they did get this right. They were concerned about purity. But they had come to the wrong conclusion on how to achieve purity because they were looking for the answer in the wrong place because they didn't actually understand the true issue. They didn't understand what the real problem was. Their solution was what? External washings. We're going to wash our cups, wash our bowls, wash our hands. If we just wash ourselves enough, then we'll be right before God. Then we will be close to God. And the more we wash, and the more we tell other people to wash, the more it actually shows how holy and righteous and how pure we are before God. But their solution couldn't solve the problem because the problem was not external stuff. Jesus says you can't wash away your defilement. You can't scrub away your uncleanness. There's nothing you can do physically to get rid of the uncleanness of your state because it's a matter of the heart, not the hand. This is where the Pharisees went wrong. And this is where every other knockoff man-made religion goes wrong. All of them. They think that the outside how I act or how I talk or how I look on the outside is all that matters. If I can just clean up this, for some of us that might take a little bit more work than others, but if I can just clean up this, then I'll be okay before God. Then I will be pure. Then I will be allowed into heaven if I just look good enough. That's why every other religion is so focused on cleaning up the external, on fixing the outside, They're focused on on washing the cup, cleaning the hands, hoping that one day they will finally be pure enough to stand before God. Jesus will call the Pharisees in Matthew's gospel whitewashed tombs. He will say that you can scrape off all the dirt. You can give it a good wash. You can even take white paint and try to paint over everything on the outside here, but on the inside, you're still dead. You can do all of this work and it will do nothing for your internal state, for your heart, for your soul. You're still dead. External washings do nothing. They're in vain, Jesus says. Washing can never get you to the point of purity, a right standing before God. Why? Because our fellowship with God, our relationship with him, isn't broken on the basis of what we eat. Our relationship with God isn't destroyed on the basis of how clean our hands are before we put food in our mouths. It's destroyed by the personal sin in our hearts. These things that are listed in verses 21 through 23 don't defile us when they come out of us. That is, if if you could just keep these things under, under wraps, keep them from poking out, you would be fine. These things that he lists, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, enmity, slander, pride, foolishness. There's a lot of bad things that are in my heart, but you know what? If I don't act on it, I'll be okay. If I don't act on these things, I'll be fine. Again, this is where the Pharisees went wrong. They thought that their hearts didn't matter, that all that mattered was the outside. They thought it was fine that they could think and feel these things as long as they didn't actually put their hands to use in doing it. It doesn't matter if I harbor anger in my heart as long as I don't actually kill the guy. It doesn't matter if if I lust after somebody who's not my spouse as long as I don't actually sleep with them. It's fine. But what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, but I say unto you, to use the example of sexual immorality, I, I say unto you, if you even look at somebody and lust after them in your heart, you are held accountable for that. You've you've already transgressed the law because the law isn't just about what your hands do, it's about the state of your heart. Your heart is actually the one thing that, that truly matters. Your heart is the very thing that defiles you before God. That's why it's the only thing that actually matters in the case of purity. The Pharisees thought that Jesus didn't care about purity laws. They accused Jesus of transgressing, of minimizing, of of pushing away purity. 
they accuse him of minimizing the law's demands, but that's not the case at all. Jesus is actually raising the bar, isn't he? Jesus is actually intensifying the requirements of what it means to be pure. It's not just keeping your hands from doing something. You need this to be in the right place. The Pharisees only had half the deal. Yes, does it matter what we do? You're allowed to answer that. Does it matter what we do? Yes, of course it does. There are, there are commands of God that actually says, don't kill somebody. Does it matter if we do that? Yeah. But Jesus is backing up the fence a little bit. There's a cliff of sin. And the law right here said, don't kill anybody. Jesus is backing up the fence and he's saying, don't even think about it. Have your heart right before God. Have your heart attitude towards other people pure. Not just keeping your hands clean. He's saying, the outside matters, but the inside is what matters most. Jesus brings the focus back to God's word, and he holds them accountable to what God has said, that the heart is what truly matters. The question you and I need to wrestle with today, all of us need to wrestle with today, is how can our hearts actually be cleansed? Jesus has just destroyed any external hope of becoming clean before God. In vain, fruitless, void, pointless. Gets you nowhere. He's just destroyed every chance you have in yourself to actually being right before God. And he says it's all a matter of the heart. So the big question is, how can our hearts be made right before God? How can our hearts truly be cleansed? How do we get clean? This is where we need to pay attention. This is why we just walked through these marks of of knockoff religions because we need to make sure we have the real thing. If we get distracted and go go after the knockoff thing, it's not gonna fulfill, it's not gonna satisfy, it's not gonna do what we need. We need to go back to God's word. What does God's word say? What does God's word provide in terms of hope for our hearts? How can we truly be cleansed? There was a lot of blood shed in the Old Testament, wasn't there? There was a lot of blood, a lot of animals that were sacrificed on the altar to cover for sin. They were slaughtered and their their blood was taken and sprinkled and poured and dipped and thrown and splashed, not just on the altar but even on people to atone for the sin that was present in them. God's law demanded that blood be shed because blood is how sin is atoned for. That's how sin is covered up. Sacrifices were held day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. There were personal sacrifices, there were corporate sacrifices, there were family sacrifices, there were sacrifice celebrations, there was the Day of Atonement where the one sacrifice was actually made for all of Israel. There were sacrifices and blood left, right, and center. I hope you realize that when we read of all of this stuff in the tabernacle and the temple, it would have stunk because of all the blood and all of the death. A constant reminder, even in in what you smell, of how unholy and unclean you are before God. And for all of those sacrifices, for all of that death, for all of that bloodshed, not a single sin was atoned for. Not a single heart was purified before God. Because as the author of Hebrews says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It just can't do it. It's just not possible. There's no amount of animal blood that can be spilt to actually cover up even one sin of any human being. So what hope do we have? That's why Jesus Christ, the perfect eternal Son of God, left his throne on high and entered into creation, became one of us, became a human being, taking on human flesh, never once giving up his his godhood, never once giving up his divinity. He didn't cease being God He brought humanity upon himself, something never seen before, something unheard of in the history of humanity. He became the God-man. He became truly God and truly man, perfectly able to provide in his divinity and perfectly able to sacrifice in his humanity. And his whole purpose in coming was to attain what no human being could attain, what no human system, what no knockoff could achieve, What the blood of bulls and goats could never accomplish, he came to cleanse our hearts through the shedding of his own blood. He achieved the purification for sins by going to the cross on behalf of his people. 
by dying in their stead, by shedding his blood to cover the sins of the people. He takes the place of his people in death and he bears the full weight of God's wrath upon himself. How do you and I get cleansed? How how can you and I have, have a pure heart before God? We, we do need to be washed. But the washing that we need is not an external washing of our hands or our feet or our cups or even our whole bodies. It's not an external washing away of dirt that we need, but the internal washing that comes only by the blood of the Lamb. Have you been washed by the blood of the Lamb? Have you repented of your sins and come to Christ in faith? Have you ceased from trusting in your own works, your own traditions, your own knockoff ideas of how you can be pure before God? And have you come to him in his word and seen that the only way is to fall at the feet of Christ, the perfect God-man who sacrificed himself for sin? Don't look to the knockoff religions of this world. Come to Christ in faith and have all of your sin atoned for. Come to Christ to have your fellowship with God restored. Come to Christ and receive the grace of God and receive a new heart. Let's pray. Father, we confess far too often in our hearts we trust in things that they can't do anything for our souls. We put our hopes in ourselves. We put our hopes and dreams on other people. We, we look to things outside of your word and outside of your son to find satisfaction for purity. And Lord, we pray that you would remind us, as we've seen in your word today, to look nowhere else but to the son. May we cast ourselves at his feet and receive grace upon grace to wash us clean by the blood of the Lamb. It's in our precious Savior's name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the music team to come up and I would ask the rest of you to stand as you are able. We are going to sing a concluding song together. Unmeasured, vast and free, that drew me from eternity, that called me out before my birth to bring you glory on this earth. Grace amazing, pure and deep, saw me. That took my curse and all my blame So I could bear your righteous name Grace, grace, grace Paid for my sins Lost me to life Grace, grace, grace Lost me with power is right. Grace, 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 lead me to hell, where I'll see your face, and never cease to thank you for your grace. Grace abounding strong and true that makes me long to be like you that turns me from my selfless pride
to love the cross on which you died. Praise unending all my days, give me strength to run this race. And when my years on earth are through, the praise will all be. For my sins brought me to life. Grace, 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 mold me with power to do what is right. Grace, 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 lead me to heaven, or I'll see your face and never cease to thank. My sins brought me to life. Grace, 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 cloth me with power to do what is right. Grace, 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 lead me to heaven. I see your face and never cease to thank. Thank you for your grace. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Lord in heaven, we give you thanks, never any thanks for the grace that you've given to us in Jesus. We ask that as we go from here, you would remind us of this grace so that it might change our hearts to be more obedient, to be more faithful in following you. And Lord, may you well in up a great joy, an overwhelming sense of joy because of this grace in Jesus Christ so that we might have a desire to share that love, share that grace with others. Embolden us this week, our Father, to share of this good news of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, amen. Amen.